one of these films is emblematic of William Castle's highly successful run of horror movies in the 50s and 60s, a stylish blend of laughs and scares that is bolstered by a unique gimmick. The other film celebrates its 20th anniversary this year, and while it adds gruesome visuals to the story, it never dispenses with the original's ridiculous sense of fun. But which is the best? And for the first time in motion picture history, members of the audience, including you, will actually play a part in the picture. Director and producer William Castle was the god of gimmicks. Whether it was having certain cinema seats rigged up to vibrate during The Tingler, the 45 second fright break during the climax of Homicidal, or offering up a thousand dollar life insurance policy to any audience member who died of fright during Macabre, Castle always had a special marketing trick up his sleeve. The gimmick for 13 Ghosts is of particular note, as it wasn't just a one-off joke, it was a neat little tool coined Illusiono, a handheld viewer that consisted of two coloured strips, one red, one blue. Now, when you came in, you were given a special ghost viewer like this. As William Castle himself explains during the film's typically meta intro, when the blue filter appears on screen, ready your Illusiono. If you believe in ghosts, or are feeling brave, look through the red strip. If you don't believe, use the blue strip. How this worked was simple. The on-set footage was passed through a blue filter. The footage of the ghost was filmed separately, passed through a red filter, and then superimposed over the rest. Looking through the red strip of the viewer therefore emphasized the ghosts, while the blue strip nullified them. Watching 13 ghosts on your home setup now obviously lacks this feature, but I still appreciate the original intent. We can, however, still experience the wonderful opening credits. Splatters of red and blue cover the screen as the overlapping howls, moans, and screams of the ghosts bombard the audience. Then, one by one, the ghosts are each introduced with the crash of a symbol as they hurtle towards the screen. It's a minimalistic approach, but it drums up excitement for the coming spooks, especially with ghost number 13 which appears as a big old question mark, creating an element of anticipation. Crazy credits and introduction aside, we come at last to the plot, and a man named Cyrus Zorba. He's a nice guy, but money troubles are destroying his family. By some strange stroke of fate, Cyrus receives word that his uncle with an even weirder name than Cyrus Zorba, Plato Zorba, has passed away, for the second time no less and Cyrus is due to inherit the large mansion estate. Good timing, yes? Almost too good, yes. The Zorba family swaps furniture repossession for furniture possession. That's right, Uncle Plato was known to dabble in the occult, and apparently captured a host of ghosts from all across the world into his house. The family is thrilled about the lucky break, but only young Buck is thrilled about the possibility of supernatural roommates. Quite naturally, the rest of the family dismiss the claims as phony ball hockey, until a Ouija board reveals the ghostly presence around them. With the aid of Uncle Plato's special glasses, the film's real-world gimmick is utilised, and the ghosts are visibly confirmed. A spooky inherited house, a creepy distant relative, the strange housemaid in black, the hidden twist of a human villain and their secret plot. This is all classic horror 101, but that's a comforting blanket on a dark stormy Sunday. The ghosts themselves are the film's big draw, beyond the gimmick of course. While there is an air of suspense in the first half, and an obvious 61 year old jump scare did catch me off guard, the ghost scenes themselves are rather hit or miss. Early on we see a set of four ghosts haunting Cyrus. It was pretty effective at first, especially the creepy floating head. Maybe it's just me, but when they all set on fire, it did make me a little uneasy. A shame, but the cartwheel display that immediately follows it is about as scary as watching your annoying six-year-old cousin endlessly showing off their fucking basic yo-yo tricks. The story of an Italian chef caught in a time loop of murdering his wife and her piece of gabagool on the side is a fine addition 
but the impact is lessened when they sound like Jawas squabbling over a bad motivator. Likewise, the ghost lion and the headless lion tamer could be engaging, but the scene long overstays its welcome. When the punchline finally arrives, revealing the tamer was searching the lion's jaws for his own head, I'm over it. The end game hauntings from Plato Zorba himself, coming out of the painting, exacting revenge and all that, that's all pretty well done. William Castle was wise to include what I suppose you would call sketches throughout the film. Every now and then, before we transition to the next scene in the plot, we'll get a quick 20 second ghost show that does not involve the characters or progress the story at all. But this gives us the content we showed up for, without having to watch Cyrus or Buck or whoever awkwardly stand around looking afraid. Right, it sounds like I'm laying pretty hard into the film, but that's not the case. I have a lot of individual nitpicks with it, but as a whole, I find it to be an endearing slice of horror's past. The low body count does not offend me in this case, as it's a fun family romp, and a rare case where a whole horror family is actually likeable. The chemistry between the two children, Medea and Buck, is a delight, full of relatable sibling bickering, but the fondness for each other is plainly felt. The maid serves her purpose as the butt of the joke for the most part, a kind of parody of the character archetype, but the twist reveal is cute, and I also enjoy her love for a good seance and Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. What can we expect? Dr. Zorba and I experienced total recall with some spirits. So yeah, 13 Ghosts is still a breezy, watchable horror from a bygone age, but I admire a fair amount. However, much of my admiration comes from its place in time, that old William Castle late 50s, early 60s style. How would a newer version of the story fare, amputated from this key element? I was seven years old when the remake arrived, and I'll be honest, that poster scared 13 turds out of me. Like so many childhood fears, in the cold light of adulthood it's not at all frightening, it just kind of reminds me of the lawnmower man. 13 ghosts, or should I say, for 13 in and ghosts, clearly inspired by the hit thriller The Seven In, was part of a brief lived trend of horror remakes. In the late 90s and early 2000s, horror producers decided to cash in on updates of ghost stories from the 50s and 60s. As such, this film holds company with the likes of The Haunting, House on Haunted Hill, and House of Wax. A bold move, yes, but the studios mandated that bringing in a distinguished actor would equal success utilising the talents of Liam Neeson, Jeffrey Rush, and Paris Hilton. For 13 Ghosts, they brought in Oscar winner F. Murray Abraham to play Cyrus Zorba, who was now the crazy uncle despite adopting the same name of the friendly impoverished dad from the last film. Considering how utterly mental much of this film is, they may as well have gone full hog and kept him as Plato Zorba. I don't get it. But yeah, I know what you're thinking. Amadeus fans and the demographics who are likely to attend a hip new 21st century modernization of Bloody 13 Ghosts was quite a small overlap. That's where the younger blood comes in. We got Matthew Lillard, going full Matthew Lillard. We got noted female rap star Rad Digger. And to get those really horny butts in seats, oh yeah, we got Monk. The plot begins a little differently from the original, shall we say. Cyrus and his assistant Dennis arrive at a junkyard with a team of Ghostbusters on the hunt for a nasty piece of ecto work called the Juggernaut. I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! No, not that Juggernaut, thank Christ. Dennis has psychic abilities. He's kind of like Bruce Willis in Unbreakable. If he touches you, he'll see into all your shit. This psychic hoo ha wouldn't fly on your average CV, but Cyrus laps it up and abuses it to track down ghosts, you see. Anyway, things go crazy and the juggernaut juggers everyone's noughts till the cows come home. I guess the producers thought the main storyline lacked a high enough body count, so this was slapped on to get the kiddies' attentions. It reminds me of the opening to 2002's Ghost Ship, which, incidentally, was the only other film from this director, Stephen Beck. The ghost is caught, but Cyrus is apparently killed while promoting his Zorba OnlyFans. Come! Cut to a much more familiar setting and family. The husband, the wife, the daughter, and the younger, deaf-obsessed son. Everything is not so hunky-dory, however. As the credits roll, the camera mournfully pans around the room while we hear a horrible family tragedy play out. Dad, help! Mom! Get the kids! Mom, Dad! Get the kids! It's melodramatic as hell, but a creative way to deliver your exposition. 
The wife perishes in a house fire, and the father is now struggling to make ends meet financially and emotionally. He enlists the help of a nanny called Maggie, but I'm not sure why, because she can't cook, she doesn't clean, and most importantly, she can't keep her eyes on the kids she's paid to keep her eyes on. Where is your brother? He's with Maggie. I don't... Uh, was with Maggie. Whatever. The family learn that Uncle Cyrus has passed away. Cyrus communicates his will from beyond the grave via Sega CD, and happily informs them they can inherit his home. Again, like in 1960, perfect timing. Unlike the original, however, this is no ordinary house. Unless, you know, you were raised in a home in the middle of nowhere and all the walls were made of glass covered in Latin scripture, and everything was controlled by evil-looking clockwork mechanisms. Oh, and there were bloody ghosts in the basement. The midnight housewarming party goes a little sour when Dennis shows up disguised as an electrician, and it becomes clear that Cyrus planned some grand, malevolent scheme for them. My fear going into the remake was that it would strip away the campy feel and create a more serious take. As you can plainly see, that is not the case. In fact, this film seems to revel in its ridiculous nature, and rarely attempts any actual scares. When they do try, it's not bad. For example, in this tidy shot, we enter through the lens of the ghost seeing glasses, and thus also enter ghost vision. The bathroom is revealed to be covered roof to tile in blood, but our victim is none the wiser. Ghost number six, also known as the angry princess, also known as creepy tit lady, enters the tub. The victim ain't got a clue, oh, but we do, and it's a nice moment for us to scream at our television sets. For the most part though, the ghost just kind of glare angrily through the glass walls. With so few characters involved, and many of them basically guaranteed to survive, the vast majority of the ghosts don't get a chance to shine. They feel more like bored, underpaid actors at a Halloween haunted house event. At best, they might shout BOO at you, but they're not going to risk getting fired by decapitating some punk. That said, there are moments of joy when several ghost attacks occur simultaneously. That's not too common in horror. Usually you'll stick with one set of characters or action to appropriately build up suspense. Not here. It lends the film some scenes of great energy, something that both versions of 13 Ghosts could use more of. Both versions also suffer from that old cinematic Batman adage, too many villains spoil the broth. Listen, we're looking at a total of 26 ghosts, but how many of them are truly memorable? Honestly, I could probably only count them on one hand. It's unfortunate, because it's a great title and a brilliant setup for hosting a variety of different spookies, but with 90 minute runtimes and a lack of fodder to be killed off, there's not much you can do. In the remix case, if you want to know anything about most of the ghosts, you have to check out the DVD special features. That's pretty shitty. It's the Hobbit problem, isn't it? 13 ghosts, 13 dwarves. You've got your main men that get something to do, and then you've got the ones who you recognise but don't particularly engage with, and then there's the rest who are just kind of there. I will say this, credit to the remake for trying to add some emotional stakes to the madness. Making the deceased wife one of the ghosts was a welcome reversal, and provided the ending with some feeling. Okay, let's wrap this up. On to the verdicts. Best cast. Pound for pound, the remake obviously has the advantage of a recognisable cast. Matthew Lillard is a lot of fun, but he won't be to everyone's tastes. Abraham is properly hammering it up, which is amusing in itself. Monk does an alright job, but otherwise they kind of fall flat. The kids are meh, and Maggie is whiny, kind of like me right now. I haven't even mentioned the scummy lawyer with the punchable face, or the woman who just absolutely belongs in a horror film from 2001. Screw them. The original's family unit are all likeable people, simple as that. I root for the father and his passion for both his loved ones and for paleontology. Buck's one-track ghostly mind made me laugh frequently. Medea is a charming lass, and not even close to being insufferable, like most comparable characters. The mother is the weakest link, but she's harmless. Sneaky Ben and the sneaky maid make for an intriguing not-what-they-seem supporting cast too. So, the original takes my first vote. Best, best overall ghosts, 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 ghosts. Both films have their share of effective ghosts and forgettable ghosts. Overall, I gotta give it to the remake. There's a bit more thought in the designs, and they get to interact with the story more prominently. Best, 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 best. Sticking with the remake, I think my vote goes to the Jackal. 
while most of the ghosts don't receive a single standout scene, the Jackal gets two of the film's more intense moments. Dennis being aware of them beforehand as if the ghost is famous, and saying the line about them being the Charles Manson of the ghost world, that's an alright bit of build-up. Best, best, kill, best, kill, best, kill, best, kill, best kill. Horror movies of this period really like deaths where the characters get mathematically sliced into pieces. To be fair, it is rather clean and satisfying, especially when it happens to a prick like the lawyer. The relative slowness of the death and the out-of-sync halves sliding down the glass push it over the edge for me and take the top spot. Best, best film, 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 film. Now, this is tough. Both contain features I love and parts that don't really work at all for me. The original goes by easily on its 60s charm and unique gimmicks. The remake is messy and all over the place, but I can't deny that it entertains me too. Despite the fact that it could have, and should have, offered us more ghost action with a higher body count, by a hair, I am choosing the remake. As always, let me know if you agree or disagree with any of my choices. I can certainly understand the arguments on either side of this debate.